Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. A uh, very well, warm welcome to the second webinar in our new webinar series, Agrarian Conversations. Today's webinar will discuss some of the complex questions emerging around global food regimes and China. How is the global food system changing and what role does China have to play? This webinar will be in English with interpretation to French, Spanish and Mandarin. Please see the instructions on your screen and in the chat uh, for accessing translation. And please don't hesitate to ask in the chat if you have any questions about the interpretation. My name is Ruth Hall, Pro Professor of Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of the Western Cape. I'm joining you from Cape Town, South Africa, and we're thrilled to be partners in hosting these conversations. I will be chairing today's webinar together with Katie Sandwell of the Transnational Institute, which is anchoring these webinars. Hi, Katie. And Katie is joining us uh, from Amsterdam. Katie will introduce our speakers, but first a quick word to introduce the Agrarian Conversations webinar series. What makes Agrarian Conversations special in a world where so many webinars are on the go? Firstly, we're bringing together scholars and activists, scholar activists and others, building a, a global community. We're reversing some hierarchies that we continue to struggle against by foregrounding the voices of people, activists and scholars in and from the global south. And we're putting the insights and experiences of women and younger scholars at the center of our conversations. This is about opening up dialogues to make sense of what's going on in our world. And this is why we have shared some background reading for each webinar. You can see a link in the chat. Uh, it is open access to the paper by Phil McMichael that is the background for today. We're also keeping these discussions uh, active and interactive with short, sharp inputs. These are not academic lectures. Also, this series is unapologetically political in our purpose and our outlook. Our concern here is to make sense of what contemporary changes mean for agrarian struggles. We'd also like to note as we start that we're aware that there is a narrative about China's role in the global food system that tends towards China bashing. We are not here for such crude discourses. Our task here is to seriously engage uh, politically with the changing realities and the most urgent political struggles of our day in relation to the food system and the global food regime. The series of conversations are being organized by a wide range of networks and organizations, including the Journal of Peasant Studies, the Collective of Agrarian South Scholar Activists, the Programme for Land and Agrarian Studies, um, ICAS, Yara, ERPI, PASTRES, and RUSHES. I'm going to use the acronyms. All the details are there in the chat. And also the Transnational Institute, which is hosting us today. These events cost money to organize. So if you have appreciated our webinars, please consider making a donation via TNI or any of the partners to support this series. The, the main cost is to ensure that these are as inclusive as possible, uh, which requires interpretation. So now I'm going to hand you over to Katie to let you know about the format for today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth, uh, for that great introduction to the series. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers as we go along, as each of them speaks, but just to let you know the, the general format, we'll open with Philip McMichael, who will speak to us outlining some key thoughts from and building on the background paper which has been shared uh, that's available in the chat, and you also received a link uh, by email in advance. We will then ask four respondents, Jan Hairong, Paul, Rafilwe, and Andrea, all to respond very briefly. We've asked them to take just a few minutes each for an initial response, and then we'll open up a little bit of dialogue, doing one more round, giving each speaker just one or two minutes to respond to each other's thoughts and observations. After that, we'll open the conversation to include your questions and comments. 
And finally, Carol has taken on very bravely the task of summing up today's conversation, closing out the, uh, today's webinar by drawing a few of the major themes uh, in a few minutes at the end of the session. I want to start with just a few technical points before we get into that. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, this webinar is being interpreted and you should have the information in the chat on how to access the interpretation. But I'd like to remind all of our speakers, uh, especially myself, please to speak slowly and clearly in spite of the short time that we have together to make sure that you can be interpreted well. For the audience, I'd like to invite you, as I see many of you already have been doing, to use the chat space. Uh, please use that to share any technical issues, but also your perspective, uh, comments or thoughts that you wish to share with other audience members. Throughout the session, we'll be sharing links to resources and to further reading in that section as well, so keep an eye on it. We also know there's a lot of knowledge among all of the attendees, so we appreciate hearing your perspectives there. To share questions for the panelists, which we'll ask at the end of the session, I'd ask you please to use the Q&A box in the center of your screen. Because the chat can be quite busy, this helps to ensure that they won't get lost. Finally, if you're on Twitter or on other social media, we're using the hashtags, uh, hashtag agrarian conversations and hashtag food systems for today's webinar. So feel free to share your thoughts and reflections with us there as well. With all that said, I'd like to hand the floor over now uh, to the people you came here to listen to. So our first speaker, Philip McMichael, is a professor of Professor of Global Development at Cornell University and the author of the 2007 book, Food Regimes and Agrarian Questions, among many others. He works with the Committee on World Food Securities, Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism, known as the CSM. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Phil. Phil, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Katie. Um, greetings all and uh, many thanks to Katie and Jess for setting this conversation up, as well as to T and I for supporting it. And also thanks to Ruth and June. So what's the point of the food regime concept? It's to emphasize that modern geopolitical conjunctures include powerful, uneven international food provisioning relationships. As such, they embody tensions. As expressed by Lavea Campesina in 2000, in defining what I call the recent corporate food regime in its evocative term, agriculture without farmers. Here, agribusiness powered by market rule subjects territorial farm cultures across the world to cheap food dumping, land grabbing and value chaining. Javier Campesina said, massive movement of food around the world is forcing the increased movement of people. And this has been intensified since via financialization and private access to public credit through so-called public-private partnerships. Meanwhile, new agro-export states such as Brazil and Argentina have decentered Western breadbasket power with multipolar multipolarity, enabling an increasing precarity of complex corporate state deals with governments yielding territorial integrity, food security, nutrition, and producer rights to financial relations, plus deepening techno-fetishism with biodigital control versus farming cultures and ecosystems. Note that while the PRC has been replicating Western agricultural modernization with some land transfers and recurring seizures by unscrupulous local governments, it maintains its peasant sector, harnessing it for the national political project of economic security. It's interesting to note that the Chinese Director General of the FAO, Ji Dongyu, views food policy as, and I quote, investment in rural life. So where are we now? COVID has unmasked regime violence and inequalities, for example, in faltering global supply chains and deepening hunger, as well as fractured multilateralism. This represents a moment of shock for the international community, and it coincides with the UN invitation to the World Economic Forum to lead, lead the 2021 Food Systems Summit and to replace multilateral food governance with the doctrine of corporate governance. 
This represents a shift from WTO multilateralism with states internalizing market rule to replacing UN or state responsibilities for food security governance and human rights with the World Economic Forum proclaiming the corporations are trustees of society. Now, this is not an innocent turn of events. It takes place in the context of reform of the Committee on World Food Security, the UN Committee, including the civil society voice of frontline producers and workers and indigenous peoples who manage 80% of the world's biodiversity, plus mushrooming socio-environmental activism and a rising recognition of agroecological sciences and practices, as well as the evidence security in territorial shortening of supply chains. Now, this attempt to erase the promise of agroecological farming as a shared science in its own right is not simply another disconnected tool in the toolbox, as corporates claim. Is this simply a consolidation of the food regime via direct corporate capture with no public pretense, or simply a shock doctrine reflex to stem activism, public intervention, and agriculture with farmers? So what's to come? While agriculture with farmers doesn't have the voice given to or taken by agriculture without farmers, it has proliferating networks of grassroots initiatives in ecological and cooperative farming across the world. For example, farmers avoiding debt and ecocide from value chaining, from European farm belts through the US Midwest to Southern India's zero budget natural farming. At this point, we should note the momentous Indian Farmers Rebellion versus Prime Minister Modi's proposal to dismantle public protections of its huge farm sector. In my view, this compares with China's retention of its modern peasant sector, where as Plough notes, the public right to land has been the exception to the Western discourse of farms as private economic holdings subject to economic dispossession. Now China's historic land reform stabilized much of its agrarian sector, perhaps modeling, modeling territorialization of food systems for food regime transitioning, as well as to restore ecosystems and build multifunctional agriculture with farmers. Meanwhile, China is strengthening state property for rural revitalization by President Xi's new concept of dual circulation, which I like to term in international self-reliance, where securing an integrated national economy complements global engagement to enhance China's global political economic power anchored in part by the Belt and Road Initiative. China's state-centered strategy offers a timely alternative to over four decades of the World Bank's 19 80 redefinition of development as participation in the world market. So what, it got, what has this got to do with food regime transition? I view China as playing the short and the long game. The short game is the recent global particip participation in WTO, in the WTO neoliberal, neoliberal order via state owned enterprises and for-profit companies. Plus in the long game, deployment of the Belt and Road Initiative to build long-term trade and land and sea transport systems to the West via routes, via, here's a quote from President Xi, via routes the US military cannot disrupt. These networks diversify sources of agri-food and seafoods anchored by a complementary infrastructure and private investment from China, particularly in Southeast Asia for offshore grains, Australia for animal protein and consolidating access to Central Asian and Russian wheat. And of course, soy fields in South America. China is the world's largest food importer. It has 9% of the world's land, but 20% of the world's population. With its middle class doubling by 2025, from 480 million to 780 million. 
Departing from WTO rules, China's long-term security projections include deploying sovereign wealth funding of neo or agro mercantilist strategies of direct access to offshore food supplies. Rising Chinese investment in African agriculture it appears to be less for sources and more as a hedge against long run food insecurities. The emphasis on infrastructure involves some state empowerment and agency in negotiation, modeling South-South cooperative state managed developmentalism. It's interesting that the focus of the United Nations Food Systems Summit upcoming um, is likely to be Africa. So there, that's a, um, a field of competition, so to speak. Now, China's engagement in the global food regime offers the possibility of focusing on eco ecological damage to farmland. This is a territorial priority in China, for, obviously, um, if not necessarily offshore, for example, in soy fields. So this, I would um, argue, is the conundrum of so-called international self-reliance. In short, while China crosses the river by feeling the stones, engaging with neoliberalism, it's also constructing parallel institutions and networks, but institutions in particular, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and alternative diplomatic, economic, and digital networks in service of its long game. Now, whether this broad initiative includes modeling and potentially sponsoring what Plug and Ye call the Chinese agricultural paradigm centered on agricultural multifunctionality rather than technological fetishism remains to be seen. In the meantime, the question is, can food sovereignty initiatives and movements call states to account, exercise the kind of solidarity we see in India now and re-embed agri-food markets in social and ecological priorities and principles of food sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you so much for those thoughts, Phil. Um, that's wonderful. We'll pass now to Yan Hai Rong, uh, our second speaker. Yan Hai Rong teaches at Hong Kong Polytechnic University and researches China-Africa links, the racialization of labor, China's agrarian change, and collective and co cooperative rural economy. Um, she has contributed to IPES Food, the International Panel of Experts on Food Systems, and the Food Sovereignty Network in China. Yan Hai Rong, please go ahead. Okay, thanks Katie. Uh, thanks Ruth, and also to all the partners that have made this event possible. I'll make three points touching on agrarian change in China and China's global engagement and see if I can save a minute even. <laughs> My first point is about um, agrarian change in China. So China today has about 230 million rural households and Chinese policymakers term, term China as a large country with small holders. In the past two decades, however, we have witnessed a continual process of de and de-agrarianization. So urbanization rate grew from 36 points, 36 percent uh, in two, uh, two, 2000 to 60 percent in 2020. So while smallholders are indeed still dominant majority, the leading actors in the agrarian sector are capital accumulating entrepreneurial farmers and agribusiness. In the recent decades, the Chinese government has been moving Chinese development strategy away from export dependency to emphasizing internal circulation and has recently proposed the term dual circulation that is both internal and external. Relatedly, in 2017, the Chinese central government proposed rural re revitalization as a development strategy that was stretched to 2050. Chinese government considers food self-sufficiency as foundational policy and requires 95% self-sufficiency for rice, wheat, and maize. Yet currently, as Phil has pointed out, China is the largest food importer in the world, with 70% of the import being one single commodity, soybeans. With the current uh, global epidemic, the government has um, 
making, has been making close monitoring of the domestic food production. About China's global agrarian engagement, Phil notes a difference in, in his earlier publication, um, but he touched on today a little bit, uh, the term. Phil notes a difference between European, Asian, and uh, Middle East and North African states, MENA states, in global agrarian activities. Uh, European states uh, rely on WTO liberalization and investment protocols, while Asian and MENA states practice agro-mercantilism. Uh, that is, they bypass market access and override WTO trade rules. Instead, they seek direct access for food supplies by bilateral arrangements enabled by states or sovereign wealth funds. Based on my research in parts of Africa, uh, Chinese agrarian activities do ride, ride on the tide of WTO liberalization and are mostly driven by investors' own initiatives for profit and mostly supply domestic markets for host countries and therefore are not, in my view, agro-mercantilist. In my research in Zambia and Uganda, I find that Chinese, farm, Chinese farms there produce for domestic markets while they export their products to China. Exporting to China is simply not cost effective. Let me also use Zimbabwe and Brazil as examples. And I thank Thomas, for, who's also here today, for sharing his research findings in Brazil. So prior to Chinese presence, two countries had already been exporting tobacco and soybeans to China. The presence of Chinese companies in these two countries uh, does, does not so much change the direction of the flow of tobacco and soybeans to China. Uh, because without Chinese companies, other companies will also do the export to, the, to China. But the presence of Chinese companies has the impact of disrupting the existing dominance by Global North companies in these two countries and therefore reduce their share of the profit. In these two countries, Chinese companies, like other companies, practiced contract farming, uh, but offered higher purchase price for local producers, therefore increased Chinese companies' market share and profit. So in yeah, short, I do not one quite... minute. Oh, okay, Sorry. thanks. In short, I do not quite agree that Chinese activities are agro-mercantilist, but I do like Phil's phrase of international self-reliance for characterizing Chinese food security strategy. The strategy is seeing the relationship between parts and whole, or as the Chinese saying goes, if big rivers have water, the small rivers can be full. Um, my third point is suggestion for engaging Chinese practices. Um, there's no Beijing consensus in China. The term sets a contrast to Washington consensus, but the term is actually not coined or used by Chinese government. In the global context, Chinese practices on the whole do not represent the alternative, but have a reformist approach to global engagement that is investments and loans do not require privatization or austerity. They do not require retreat of the state. And occasionally they do break the existing monopoly and creating new dynamics, which needs further scrutiny. So in my view, Chinese government strategy for rural revitalization and her most recent policy that's issued just two days ago, prioritizing ecological protection and ecological valorization in China, but possibly also promoting it globally, could enable discursive openings for activist engagement. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Yan Rong, and sorry for uh, the short time, <laughs> but thank you That's for those right. excellent insights. We'd like to go now to our next speaker, Rufilwe Joala, Rufilwe is a PhD uh, candidate at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of the Western Cape, as well as a member of the Young African Researchers in Agriculture Network. Her research focuses on the rise of soya in Zambia and the role of agribusiness capital in restructuring local agri-food systems. Rufilwe, please go ahead. Rufilwe, I think you are on mute still. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. And uh, thank you to, um, the to the panelists before me and the organizers of um, this conversation this afternoon. 
So my inputs do not address China's global um, strategy directly, but rather the outcomes of its engagement in South America and more specifically its role and impact in the global soy complex. As one of the most valuable and uh, heavily traded agri-commodities in the world, the dominance of soy rests on its uh, flexible and multiple uses consisting of soybean and um, soy oil and more, um, What's more interesting in my research, it's used as soy meal um, for feed. Politically, the global agro-industrial soy complex is driven by China. As the panelists before me have mentioned, it is the largest Im importer and consumer of soy globally. However, um, the global soy complex is controlled by a few North Atlantic uh, corporations and new agribusiness giants um, of South America's Southern Cone. And with the surge of um, the global demand for soy, processes of agro-industrialization have led to the emergence of new soy frontiers with Southern Africa seen as a new site for soy expansion. And while the rise of soy, uh, which we commonly refer to as soya, has been attributed um, to changing local diets linked to higher incomes and urbanization, the Actually, the emergence of soybean as a dominant commercial crop across Southern Africa in recent years signals um, increasingly capitalist relations of production shaped by broader restructuring and reorganization of the global agri-food system um, as we see um, China playing a more central role and even um, South American agribusiness um, uh, being important players in, 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 in the soy, in the global soy complex. So in Southern Africa's um, soybean production potential was initially highlighted in the well-known 2009 World Bank report titled Awake, Awakening Africa's Sleeping Giant. Um, since then, several initiatives have contributed towards the rise of soy in the region, including agreements between, for instance, Southern African, the Southern African Customs Union, and the um, Southern Common Market of South America, which is a preferential agreement from 2009. We've also seen um, the Chinese government investing in uh, the production of, of soy in the region through its agriculture demonstration centers um, across Southern Africa and Chinese farms, um, also in, in, in my study sites in Zambia. And Embrapa, which is the Brazilian um, research institution also playing particularly a, a leading role in Mozambique for mapping agriculture potential. And we're also seeing agreements, um, there've been agreements between Argentina and, and, and Southern Africa, just to name a few. Um, so a range of political narratives of scarcity and security have been put forth by different groups to justify the appropriation and dispossessions of resources in the interest of the expansion of this new soy frontier in Southern Africa. Firstly, increasing pressure to balance soybean production in response to growing conservation concerns in the southern cone of South America has, presented, has been presented as a compelling push factor for agribusiness capital and investor countries to mobilize resources. This framing, of course, focuses on overcoming the limits imposed by nature and is largely silent on the vast opportunities created for agribusiness capital and upstream uh, segments, as well as downstream commodity markets. The focus here is on making way for new flex um, for, for new spatial fixes through the establishment of soy frontiers in new geographies. Secondly, the rise of soy in the region is being shaped by dominant narratives of scarcity and security based on a combination of Malthusian and Ricardian perspectives. Here, high levels of food and nutrition insecurity and rural poverty are touted as justification by um, land-rich countries, mainly African governments, basically, to attract investment and um, to support corporate farmland acquisitions for the development of so-called uh, surplus and underutilized um, land, often through what's been presented as win-win inclusive business models in the form of private public partnerships. And while soybean um, production 
is dominated by large scale commercial farmers across the region. In Zambia, for instance, 80% of the production is by large scale commercial farmers. Um, the integration of smallholder farmers has resulted in the significant changes in the patterns of access and use of land and the consolidation of corporate of corporate power in, in, in Zambia's agri-food system. Um, we just one minute left, sorry. Okay, I'll just leave it there, but also add that in my study site in Mombwa, um, not only is there uh, has there been a large scale acquisition for um, for soy production, but the integration of smallholder farmers is um, changing how land is being used, what is being grown, and also local food markets, and you finding um, highly processed soy products that are being targeted at low income and mostly rural households um, in Zambia. And um, I hope I can speak further on this uh, later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to go now to Andrea Sosa. Andrea is a postdoc researcher, postdoctoral researcher of the National Scientific and Technical Research Council at the National University of San Martin in Argentina. Um, she's a lecturer at the University of Buenos Aires as well, and a member of the Collective of Agrarian Scholar Activists from the South, or CASAS, uh, and a rural social movements collaborator. Andrea, please go ahead. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for Mm, allow me to be part of this conversation. I want to point out and continue what Rufuli was saying, um, but trying to place this discussion in Latin America. So as we know, uh, China has been a central um, investor in, in Latin America since 2005 and also especially enlarged investor in Argentina since 2010. Uh, these investments are taking place in soybean production, oil and mineral extraction. So my question is what the implications, uh, what are the implications of uh, China being a major um, investor and importer of soybeans and its byproducts for the Mercosur countries that are Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Bolivia and Paraguay. So um, Sergio is one is going to share um, slides if you want to check what where these countries are. This from the corporate vision of, for example, Syngenta has been called the Soy Republic, the United uh, the United Soy Republic, uh, Soybean Republic. So you can see this is a region where the production of soybeans have uh, has expanded. Uh, soybean as being the main crop of this agribusiness model that, of course, is larger than just soybeans. Um, so this, uh, so that question and also the question of the growing presence of China in the food systems of these countries and what are the place of this of these countries in the in the transitions of the food system. So. One of, the, one of the things I wanted to point out is expansion of agribusiness as of course the implications in terms of environmental uh, degradation and social exclusion it, uh, it Im implies and also um, implications in terms of land grabbing and production grabbing. So of course, China is not the only uh, land grabber in, in Latin America. I think that is why we should talk about this multipolarity. Uh, and also it's not the only um, capital, main capital flowing to Latin America. You, we, we only have, for example, US, the US or the Netherlands, but there is this increasingly importance of China's capital in display and displacing US capital in central links of the commodity chains. For example, uh, China buying a major part of Nidera and Noble, uh, as in, um, main companies in the agribusiness chain. And also the presence of Kofco, that is a Chinese Kofco, right? Uh, that became the biggest soybean exported in 2018, uh, in, for example, in Paraguay or Argentina. Uh, and of course, it's not the only exporter, but it's a major exporter uh, along with uh, US and Russian and other. 
uh, companies. Um, and lastly, um, I wanted to well say that, especially in Argentina, we also have other kinds of investments uh, in terms of power production, direct power production in Argentina. That is one of the plans of the present government. And also investments in infrastructure for agricultural production, such as irrigation systems or energy. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, but I wanted to address a minute. Okay. Um, so what how can we address this multiple multipolarity? So what is the place of Argentina, for example, and Brazil in this new food? Uh, or transition in food system or transition into a new food system, if we ever see that. So the importance of, of soybean production and processing, as well as the case in, in Argentina of local seed breeders in association with transnational companies. So there is a place for these countries in the food regime, but also, and also the importance of translating mega companies as vehicles for international finance uh, capital and in land grabs. Um, but also there are perils of this multipolarity that in terms of what I said, environmental degradation and social exclusion. So I will leave it here and keep it going in my next minutes. Thank you so much for those very rich reflections and thank you to everyone for sticking so beautifully to their uh, to their time limits. And yeah, we will therefore have time for everyone to say a few more words at different moments. So thank you. I would like to now pass on to the our last respondent in this section, uh, Paul Nicholson. Paul is a retired Basque dairy farmer who participated with organizational and political responsibilities in the Basque Farmers Union and the Biscaya as well as in the development process of the European Farmers Coordination, today known as the European Coordination of Via Campesina. Paul, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, thank you to the organizers and to the panelists. <clears throat> I'd like to first recognize the importance of a webinar of this kind. Uh, clearly, we are we've got challenges where we need the support, the activities the, of especially academics too. Okay? Young academics like this group webinar is, uh, is creating. I think this is an important space. Uh, my intervention is going to be clearly from a perspective, a peasant perspective, which is uh, Via Campesina the international peasants movement, which encompasses more than 250 million families. Well, that is, that is our, our perspective, bottom line. You know? uh, and we have questions to ask. How is our livelihoods going to be affected by this possible new transition to a new food regime? You know? Our peasant culture, our uh, present uh, local markets, our food sovereignty, our local food system. How is this new regime going to affect us? Because obviously we struggle against the neoliberal policy. We don't struggle against specifically a country, it's against the policies. No? The policies which emphasize on the productivist model of production, of monoculture, and policies which exclude peasants from the land. So uh, in preparation for this conversation, I, we had many conversations with different regions of the world to see what was happening on the ground, to see our analysis from bottom up. And uh, the reactions have been diverse. They haven't been all the same, but very similar. Uh, first of all, the threats, the threat of the promotion of monoculture, yeah? of soya, of maize, of milk, the buying of land in all continents. It is extraordinary how we are seeing land being brought up by um, especially Chinese interests uh, in Australia, in France, 
in these mobilizations against this um, uh, buying out of land, excluding the own uh, land uh, peasants from there. At an institutional level, I think uh, we have reflected also that uh, in the FAO, uh, which is the United Nations Food Agency, a space where we have uh, the peasant organizations, the fisher organizations, the indigenous peoples, the nomad peoples, we've been um, focusing in trying to influence policy. And agroecological um, policies are beginning to come out of FAO. Uh, food sovereignty concept has been uh, introduced institutionally. And we had the director general Graziano, which facilitated the last years of this process. Now the director general is Gu Danyong, and uh, we have two important issues. First of all is uh, the relationship civil society and the new director general is complicated. Is a, uh, is a different concept, totally different, and uh, we are worried about that. And secondly, also, uh, if before the perspective was agroecology as the solution of many of the problems, environmental, social, hunger problems in the world, today we're beginning to speak about innovation, about technological fix, and that is for us very, uh, very worrying. Uh, what opportunities? There is great interest in seeing how Chinese policies have decreased rural poverty. Hmm? And it's been apparently a su very successful uh, policy. We're very interested in seeing what policies at local level have made that possible. The rural population in China is 41%. That is astonishing. And if uh, rural poverty has been reduced so dramatically, very interesting. Then the agroecological policies, what are them? What are they? What technology do they have? Uh, how is it being um, brought into place? Just there one more minute, Paul. There's another positive, and that is the Declaration of Peasant Rights. Uh, declaration by United Nations. That was approved also by China, and we would like the continuous support on that. COVID uh, is generated a new visibility of the fragility of global food regimes. This is an opportunity for the defense of food uh, sovereignty, a new model of production, and a new model of local food systems. We also think that it's important to commence uh, interchange and sharing between peasants and peasant organizations and movements with China too. Uh, it's not going to be uh, easy, but we think it is an important, uh, important movement. And at the end, I think small farmers are in, indispensable for society, for the planet, we feed the planet 70% of the food we produce, and also small farmers uh, cool the planet. Agroecological modes of production cool the planet, and climate change is part of the whole problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for these extremely rich uh, and very complimentary reflections. We would like uh, to give the opportunity now for each of the speakers to make one more brief uh, intervention, maybe reflecting on some of the other panelists, uh, on some of the uh, tensions or interesting intersections between the uh, different interventions that we've heard so far. So in the meantime, I would like to remind everyone, please, to put your questions in the Q&A box. We will go after this to the Q&A session, but we'll go around now once more in the same order. So starting again with Phil and asking the panelists to speak for just one to two minutes. So just a brief reply to, uh, to your colleagues. Phil, please go ahead. Thanks, Katie. And um, thanks so much to all of the speakers. This is a wonderful um, setup, as, as Paul was pointing out. And I hope we continue <clears throat> because it's going to become so necessary in coming years. Um, I, um, I think the only comment I'd like to just 
make with um, Hirong's um, talk is uh, is about the <clears throat> the issue of um, agro security mercantilism, and um, it's interesting. It's an interesting concept because it's 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 almost a form of reversal of merc mercantilist reversal, where um, it's um, it's not about um, exports so much, although that's part of what China's up to <clears throat> in the global economy, um, including food exports. But um, it's also about, um, it's about reversing that and the, the way in which China is um, setting up for the long game um, for a diversified food source access offshore. And I, I think the difference between the short and the long game for me um, is, is a way to recognize that um, China is very much involved with you know, corporate acquisition and all kinds of um, um, destabilizing and um, um, deg degrading investments offshore, as some of the speakers mentioned. Um, so it's playing the role in the current corporate food regime, as I like to call it, or, or some people like to call it the neoliberal food regime, whatever it is, it's market rule. Um, but now it's being complicated with um, state uh, intervention, um, particularly from the MENA states, the East Asian states, um, who are um, late starters, if you like, and um, need to get in the game um, and um, compete with the Europeans and the Americans, et cetera, the agro-exporters. So, so I think it's important to, to just recognize that as, as a tendency. It's not the whole story, of course, and I think Hairong made that point clear, clearly enough. The only other thing I'd comment on, uh, maybe in relation to what Paul was saying and some of the other speakers, is I'm not so sure that um, um, <clears throat> if, if um, the corporate capture doesn't succeed, um, that we'll have a new food regime because um, the food sovereignty concept to me um, resembles the idea of um, countries or regions becoming much more territorialized um, food systems um, and not engaging in long distance food trade as we've seen and, and of course land grabbing etc. Now that's a, um, that's a wishful hope possibly in the longer term but this is where the long game comes in I think we're really at an interesting tipping point in the world and the corporate capture by the um, WEF I don't think is going to um, work through the food system summit which is so badly organized very haphazard, haphazard very opaque um, stakeholderism um, is not going to do it, um, except it, it's, a, it's a guise or a smokescreen for corporate capture. But um, I, th I don't think corporate capture can succeed in the long term um, be because it's so destabilizing of, in, of social and environmental, ecological, climate relations, etc. cetera. Um, and so I think we need to think about um, the long game and um, undermining the possibility of a new powerful food regime organized across the world. Um, and I think the, um, the long food movement concept that IPES is promoting right now, um, you know, points out that um, this is a very interesting moment we're in. Um, it's a very fraught moment. It's not clear how it's going to play out, but we need to organize. And that's what um, Paul, I think, was trying to emphasize. I'll hand over. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for that uh, optimistic rallying note. Um, and we'll pass now to Yan Harong. Okay. Um, well, um, I also want to thank Phil for bringing that issue up again. Um, I think uh, I certainly agree that the Chinese uh, state is very much involved and uh, is like taking a certain kind of stewardship in, in terms of uh, having a long term planning for um, engagement uh, in a global agrarian uh, sector. Uh, however, I think my understanding of the um, mercantilism is um, whether you play by the um, WTO rules or not, in, in a sense. Uh, I'm not interested, I'm not saying that's, you know, playing, playing by the rule is a good thing, not playing by it is a bad thing. I'm not saying that. But I think what I've been observing so far is that uh, it seem, they seem to be actually having uh, a reformist, but also a um, uh, globalist approach uh, so far to, to the food security issue. Um, but one thing I also want to uh, point out that all the speakers, I mean, I really appreciate all the speakers' points here. 
um, because we're all actually coming, it's interesting, all five of us actually are coming with a certain kind of food sovereignty uh, uh, start point. And that's also the kind of uh, objective that we hope to achieve. So by doing that, one thing, I think perhaps one thing we, we might want to, uh, that we didn't talk about is how the, the, the question of consumption. Uh, which is actually impacting on the, the, on the productionist uh, perspective that's now promoted, giving the alibi to, uh, to corporations and to states in terms of promoting to have all those captures. And I think perhaps uh, that, that's perhaps something that we can think more about. I'm mean, just using one soy, soybean import into China as a case. I mean, so much soybean inputs into China, do we really need it? But uh, who, is, who is doing the importing? Uh, and who's saying that we actually need all the soybeans? So a lot of these things are actually being pushed on consumers, pushed onto Chinese market. Yet on the other hand, you know, you, you get into the whole thing about China importing so much, but missing the whole link about corporations making profit by doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yan Heron. And I'd like to pass now to Rafil Wei. Thank you, Katie. Um, my um, summing up points are somewhat contradictory. On the one hand, um, I'm based on my research in, in Zambia and what I'm seeing um, happening on the region, it's likely that the Brazilian model for soy production could very um, likely take hold with obviously um, continued um, corporate farmland acquisitions and this very superficial and um, in a lot of ways adverse incorporation of smallholders into these uh, value chains. Although production seem, it remains largely for domestic markets, um, these value chains still um, continue to marginalize small ho smallholder farmers um, in many ways. So on the one hand, um, I'm quite concerned about that model and um, the consolidation of corporate power in, in, in our food systems, which um, to some extent, uh, like to some extent um, remain untouched in the sense that you still had a lot of local production happening and um, small uh, local markets surviving. But now we're seeing the encroachment of um, corporates into that space. Um, so on the one hand, there's that grim picture, but on the other hand, um, this idea of a potential, you know, new food regime taking hold, um, I think COVID has presented um, new opportunities, uh, certainly in South Africa, and even in the case of Zambia, where government uh, was even saying that COVID is um, COVID is sort of like a silver light lining for um, smallholder and local agriculture because of the export bans that it led to and um, also consumers becoming more um, aware and caring more about um, food channel, uh, the, the, the food uh, procurement channels and how food is being produced and so forth. So on the one hand, they certainly, um, at least in, 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 in the medium term, um, I think we're still going to see a lot of um, marginalization of uh, the informal food sector and smallholder producers. But on the one hand, I think, um, as Yan Harang was, was mentioning, um, consumers have the power to sort of um, turn the tide and perhaps um, COVID is a moment that's sort of created, um, that is creating this momentum. Um, I, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll go to Andrea. Okay, I will try to draw on this question of consumption and also contradictions that have been mentioned. The first thing is I think that actually consumption has probably became become one of the drivers of food uh, transition, food regime transitions, but maybe only one of them. And that is um, a question about who is going to consume and what, right? So 
Are we talking about, for example, a, a small part of consumers being able to access uh, healthy food uh, through, for example, organic agriculture? Or are we thinking about uh, food that is going to be produced by farmers that have um, good labor conditions and also uh, produce healthy food? So the question here is, I think, uh, who is going to lead the transitions of the food regime? Now at present, we can see the result of corporate-led recent developments in these transitions. And in the case of Latin America, we can see that Latin America has uh, internalized the so-called externalities of this agribusiness model uh, in the present transition in food regime. So uh, this is not a sustainable place for the region in, in particular, as long as it continues in the way of uh, modernizing and the path of modernizing industrial agriculture. So then I will go to contradictions. So I think contradictions are a main part of these transitions. Um, in Argentina, we, we see some uh, uh, contradictions in terms of uh, public policies, for example. Of course, we, we can see a support to agribusiness that is clear, uh, but we can also see some signs of support to family farming and peasant movements and agroecology, as, for example, in the previous government uh, in Brazil. So um, I think that the agrarian model is at stake here. And of course, these signs are not just coming alone. They come because there has been a lot of resistance and a lot of social movements and farmers' networks crea uh, creativity in terms of creating other ways of producing food and also organizing. Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for, for drawing attention to that. I would like for the final comment to pass to Paul, and we'll then go to the Q&A. Paul, go ahead. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I'll catch up on that. Yes, I, uh, my main points are going to be resistance. Is there going to be a resistance? What kind of resistance is there going to be? It's inevitable that there's going to be a resistance. And I think it's going to be locally based. Personally, I think that the resistance will come by creating networks at local level. Um, uh, also at consumer level, the CSAs are gaining strength. Uh, as it was said before, also, uh, there's the danger that organic becomes for uh, middle classes, etc. But no, I think uh, the struggle is going to be more social. And then um, what we're seeing also on the ground is that uh, you have either industrial based uh, farms, big corporate driven uh, production selling to the corporate or otherwise you have the small local agroecological farms who feed the local markets. And there's no, there's no middle ground. Those medium-sized farms are dropping out. They cannot mm -hmm. compete in the corporate uh, sphere. So as they are basically in debt, it's a huge problem for them. So the transition is there also for the model, the social model of uh, production. And, and the third and the third question is um, the declaration of peasant rights. It was a huge uh, effort. It was a huge success for the whole global movement to have a recognized a declaration of peasant and uh, rural workers' rights. We know it's not binding, but it was approved uh, by a good majority. And now our task is to making sure that that is put into place. It's not only uh, labor rights, it's, it's a huge uh, rural uh, society difference. I think that will be important in all continents. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for those reflections already on, on strategies and on tools for resistance. I think um, already anticipating some of the great questions that we've seen coming in through the Q&A box.
so thank you very much, everyone, uh, to the speakers for their reflections and to all of you who have been posing your amazing questions in the q and I'm gonna pass over to Ruth now for the first round of questions. Thanks, Katie. Amazingly, we're on time. And so we'll have two rounds of Q&A um, in the mode of asking for answers, but also provoking some debate among the speakers. Uh, so I'm gonna pick out a few and thanks very much to the incredible team who've been filtering these questions and uh, organizing them thematically. Um, one framing issue is an observation from a Lazar Conforti who says food sovereignty tends to be cast as the antithesis of the neoliberal or corporate food regime. But if there's a fourth China-centered agro-mercantilist food regime emerging, one that involves state-led development, how would this affect the food sovereignty movement and its vision? So perhaps let's hold that and think about it. But I want to ask uh, at this point um, for clarifications, particularly from uh, our speakers. I have a question for Phil. Uh, can you clarify agro-mercantilism? Does agro-mercantilism play a role also in palm oil trade deals, uh, as well as the focus that we've had here on soya? And how does China deal with the main commodity traders like BlackRock, Cargill, in terms of costs and commodity prices? Um, and can this internationalization uh, of the food system be seen as agro-mercantilist? Uh, for instance, um, do we see this reflected in the engagement by uh, the major trading company, Kofco? Paul, there's a question about how do we support uh, sustainable value chains for indigenous food cultures, given that increasingly indigenous foods are being commercialized and, uh, and captured uh, by corporate uh, circuits? Hi, Rong. Um, we have a question from Jörg Novak, who observed that there's a bit of a tension between your view outlining that there might not be a unitary strategy by China, but rather different actors coming from China with different interests, and Phil's view that we can identify uh, a road of China, taken by China as a unit towards a new food regime. Is there a tension between your views here? Uh, Rafil, we have a quick question around, could you clarify, on the one hand, uh, the drivers of uh, the, the soya boom, uh, the small farmer integration, to what extent is it driven by farmers themselves or by corporates? Uh, what is the role of the state? And is this actually re-peasantization? So those are big questions, each of which uh, would require probably um, a week to discuss, but I think that you're going to get one to two minutes each. So let's start right now uh, with, um, with Phil, can you clarify the agro-mercantilism question? And then we'll go on to Paul on indigenous foods. Uh, Hai Rong on the tensions between your views of China and Phil's, and then Rafil Wei on small farmers. And we'll get to you, Andrea, in the second round. Thanks. Thanks, Ruth. And um, thanks for the question. Um, so, I mean, I deployed the concept of agro-security mercantilism um, simply to make the point that there seemed to be um, a shift in the way in which um, certain states, particularly Middle Eastern states, um, Korea, China um, also, were using the state and sovereign wealth funds really to establish access um, and infrastructures and access to food supplies offshore. Um, for long-term food security issues. And obviously the Middle Eastern states, North, North African states, um, um, you know, were losing land um, to, to drought and desertification, et cetera. And China's huge population um, and concern about accessing food security in the long run, um, you know, the, were the principal drivers, I think. So, so I was using it really to, to try and emphasize that, um, that these were particular states that were, getting in the game of getting access to food, but not using the normal channels established by WTO liberalization of trade rules, et cetera, but by states actually taking a firm hand in, in setting up um, such possibilities offshore. So as I tried to say, mercantilism, uh, it's, a, it's a reverse kind of mercantilism from the kind that the Europeans used um, during the colonial period. And, and of course the Americans used um, 
in the post-war period with food aid, where they were exporting food um, to client states on the perimeters of the world of the, of the Cold War. Um, so it's a, it's a different strategy and um, it, it's, um, uh, you can take it or leave it, but I think it, it, it helps to underline the, the, the problem of late starters um, in an American dominated, European dominated um, global food system. Um, and it does touch on the, the first general question that we got, and that is the, um, <clears throat> the, the growing recognition, some of it's coming out of COVID, of course, of the need for state-led initiatives. And, and so we'll talk about that later. But um, the China um, you know, works with the financiers um, also, and that's what I was referring to in shorthand to the, um, to the state firm complex, the multiplex, as opposed to the multipolarity relations. So I think the multiplex relations are a better way of capturing what's going on where states and firms enter into deals, um, surrender territorial, integrity and so forth. And, and that's a very important distinction from multipolarity, which tends to focus really on trade between countries. I think it's a much more complex world now and it's um, fueled also by um, financialization. Uh, so I'll stop there so the other speakers can chime in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. And we'll pick up on some of these issues with Hairong in a moment. First, Paul, did you want to respond on this point about uh, the commercialization of indigenous foods. Um, in what way is, uh, are there possibilities for sustainable value chains in indigenous food cultures? Do you see that emerging? Uh, Phil, just unmute yourself. Ah, good. Um, I think uh, indigenous farm, uh, is a uh, is the same reality or very similar reality to uh, peasant farmers. In fact, mostly they are. So uh, we're speaking about uh, a cultural production of food, food uh, which is local, and I think it is utopian and probably absolutely contradictory for an indigenous village, for example, or indigenous. Um, uh, people or even uh, peasant farmers community uh, somewhere in I don't know, Africa or anywhere to believe that they can export to the big markets in Europe or United States. That is the, the experiences of that have failed completely. So I think uh, one must uh, produce food for our local people in all the variety possible, with the best health possible. Right, okay, so uh, we're gonna come back to this question of uh, neoliberal multilateralism and corporate food regime versus food sovereignty and, and this question of the significance of, of, of China's uh, emerging fourth food regime. Hai Rong, do you want to comment on whether there's a tension between your and Phil's um, conceptions, uh, if you'd like to respond to that question around who we mean by China? Right. Um, I think there is <laughs> there is somewhat difference, I think, uh, and a lot of people have this kind of different view, exactly how do we look at the relationship between capital and the state, uh, especially in the context of China. Um, I think um, Chinese government has always um, has been emphasizing, uh, you know, allowing the market to play, you know, to play out um, and to give the market the full uh, range of possibilities. So there's a lot of emphasis in Chinese policy papers. However, um, there is also uh, when you read the Chinese policy papers and Chinese government blueprints, you do get a sense of Chinese state is trying to herd capital. It's like herding cats, right? It's like herding, trying to herd capital. Um, but that's what they do. That's what policy paper is supposed to do. That is, they're supposed to do this kind of herding, uh, giving, giving out signals. But when you look at the practices on the ground, uh, then you do see lots of tensions, contradictions, Chinese companies, even state-owned enterprises competing with each other. I've done research in Sudan with Chinese oil companies, two big giants, Chinese giants, just 
fighting against each other. It's like Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, you know, it's very similar. That's how they compare themselves to, like, we are just like them. Um, so on the ground, the situation is actually very, I think it's very different. So you do have multipolarity, capitals and interests colliding. And in the moment of crisis, the state may strengthen its, you know, it's a hurting uh, capacity. Um, but most of the time it's actually, uh, is taking very much, you know, allowing the, the, the market and allowing these uh, capital, the corporations to play out um, their own interests. Thank you, Hai Rung. That incredibly challenges our, our concepts of, of this binary and makes us think in a more nuanced way. Rafil, where questions about uh, the drivers of this process and whether we are seeing representation or what, are, what is the kind of class character of, uh, of this soya commodity boom uh, in Zambia uh, and more generally in your perception of what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa? Thanks, Ruth. In terms of drivers, um, you have the state playing uh, an integral role, firstly in facilitating um, investment, but also through its partnerships with um, a range of institutions um, and targeting particularly uh, smallholder farmers. In Zambia, the government has um, adopted a two-pronged strategy. Um, on the one hand, it's earmarked 100,000 hectares for large-scale commercial agriculture, including soybean. And on the other hand, um, it has signed up for a range of new initiatives for um, developing the agriculture sector. Examples include the G8 New Alliance on Food Security and Nutrition, the USAID's uh, Feed the Future program, and the Alliance um, for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA. And smallholder farmers are, are being um, integrated into the soy value chain um, through uh, local NGOs that are identifying smallholder farmers and training them on demonstration farms and also uh, encouraging them to use hybrid seeds and uh, fertilizer and so forth. So um, those have been the main drivers in terms of smallholder um, production. Um, what we're seeing though, um, also is um, the rise of medium uh, of medium farms and in a way um, this flow of um, urban of, 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 of urban dwellers mainly um, people working for the state like civil servants and some business people coming back to the countryside mm -hmm. and investing in boom crops such as soy as well as um, crops that are covered under state subsidy programs, in the case of Zambia, um, a maize, where the state provides inputs and also markets um, for that commodity. And in, in from that perspective, I guess one could actually characterize it as, as a form of representation by bringing in the city to, by bringing back the city mm -hmm. to the countryside. Um, in that sense, thanks. Thank you so much, Rafil. A, a representation in this case could also be quite an elitist process. Um, so let us quickly, before we go on to the second round, I do want to give a chance to um, uh, to uh, Andrea to quickly talk about uh, an issue that you've been asked about in the in the Q and A, which is, could you talk about the effects of uh, this soy expansion in the Southern Cone? on environmental pollution uh, and their concerns about mega projects being established in Argentina, particularly for pork production. Uh, and uh, is there a pushback happening within Argentina uh, regarding the environmental implications of this uh, transition? One minute. Okay. <laughs> so um, regarding the environmental impacts, there are several and they are more visible and people are, um, more aware of them. Uh, they imply deforestation, uh, contamination of water and air, and um, also, uh, well, contamination in food itself. And uh, in terms of, um, well, uh, that is what uh, why we can see, especially in Argentina, but also in other Mercosur countries, right? 
I'll, I'm sorry, the, the second part of the question was? Um, uh, it was specifically that there are um, expanding projects or mega projects being proposed with, uh, with Chinese partners uh, for expansion of pork production. Yeah, so there is this uh, plan of producing pork in the north of Argentina that will increase more or less 25% of pork production uh, in, in the country, but will especially be dedicated to exports to China. So there has been a lot of resistance to this project because of course, in the middle of COVID, people started relating uh, or, or um, uh, let's say industrial meat production with uh, epidemics and pandemics mm. even. Mm -hmm. So there is this plan of producing uh, a huge amount of pork in the same place. You know, there are uh, 25 farms that are being planned. And of course, the, in, in a region where um, in the north of the country in Chaco, where there is uh, water scarcity. So this will, um, yeah. Good. Andrea, we're going to have to drop it. <laughs> I'm okay. so sorry, we have to pull this to a close. Um, what we're going to do is hand over, I'll hand over now to Katie. Perhaps we can, uh, since there isn't time to answer even a fraction of the questions, uh, she will suggest a way forward for us to capture some of the questions as comments and uh, we'll take it from there. Over to you, Katie. Thank you. Very ambitious, Ruth. I'm, I'm not sure I have a strong proposal there. <laughs> What I'd like to do is uh, read a few more of the fantastic questions we received just uh, as a kind of an inspiration. I'll ask the panelists each to, to give us just one minute wrapping up uh, their thoughts. So taking those questions as inspiration rather than uh, aiming to answer them directly, because I think that will be not possible. But we have been keeping and will we'll store all of the questions that we received and use those to share those with the panelists to inspire all future future work and future thinking. Um, and after this quick round uh, of questions and final thoughts, uh, then we will pass to Carol for a, a wrap up, um, trying to summarize a few of the main themes that she's picked out during this very, very rich and wide ranging conversation. So just a few of the questions that we received. Uh, from Lydia Cabral asked, uh, international Western scholarship often talks about China as one player and one strategy. Can the panel unpack China a little further? For example, any insights on tensions between the short and long games and the different actors within and outside government in China who may be associated with each positioning? A great question. Uh, Michelle Abum says uh, to Yan Hai Rong's point about consumption and soybean imports being pushed onto Chinese consumers in the name of companies making profits. I think that's a very prescient observation. My question is who does the pushing? Uh, the Chinese government itself has been promoting consumption upgrading, for example, more milk and animal protein, ensuring great profits for Chinese and international agribusinesses involved. At the same time, this puts pressure on the food system. Do you see that this will continue? And how will Chinese policymakers deal with the contradictions arising from this consumption model? Uh, Ishita Mukopadhyaya, sorry, that's surely a poor pronunciation, but asked us the uh, very pertinent question. India was mentioned uh, by Philip. How is China's policy going to affect India as the Belt and Road Initiative passes through or touches upon India, which is currently having a historic farmer's moment where the WTO is being challenged. India is also suffering from agrarian distress and farmer suicides. And then finally, although we haven't been able to touch even this briefly on all of the questions we received, uh, finally, there has been a lot of pushback around the world against specifically Chinese agricultural investment as discussed in the Brazilian context by Gustavo Oliveira and Australia by Michel Obom. Increased restrictions on Chinese investment by the US and others are also a broader feature of the contemporary global political economy. China, meanwhile, is levying punitive tariffs on Australian barley and wine for political and diplomatic reasons. How are these kinds of dynamics likely to shape China's place in the food regime? I think these are all amazing questions, which can be the fruit also for future webinars, but I'd like to hand to the panelists just for a few final closing words each uh, before we go to Carol. Uh, so we'll start back with Phil. Okay, thanks Katie. And thanks for the questions guys. Um, 
So I'll be, I'll try and talk slower and, and be quick at the same time. Um, on palm oil, I've talked elsewhere about food, feed, fuel regime. Um, so let's go back and take, take a look at that article on, on um, agrofuels and the food regime. So um, something that I think um, Ruth mentioned about the market, the market, the state market thing not being a binary. I think um, my concept of market rule, which I take from Giovanni Arrighi's work, um, is really about collapsing that binary and pointing out that market rule um, <clears throat> involves state participation um, by definition, but also states are subject to market compulsions in a world economy dominated by transnational corporations. Go back to the World Bank's definition of development um, of participation in the world market. Um, so the other thing is that uh, what's interesting there is China is a bit of an anomaly because of the, the size of it, but also tempor temporarily, um, we're at a turning point where the American so-called liberal order um, is collapsing and China's uh, rising and it has a different view of the world. It's quite different from the West. And um, so it means that um, how China's engaging and this is why I say short and long term, um, because China's engagement um, is um, in a way contradictory in the sense, or you know, contradictory in the sense that it is participating in the neoliberal system, but at the same time, it's attempting to, to transform it or reform it, as Yan Harong points out. Um, so Ch China being an anomaly, I think is an important point to take into account. Um, on the India question, um, take a look at my paper. I, I do refer to the tension between the two countries and they're not going to be resolved that quickly. But I see the farmers' rebellion in India um, as a real counterpoint to the, <clears throat> the um, um, Chinese um, agrarian sector being relatively stable. Finally, on the question of food sovereignty, I've always felt that the concept of food sovereignty, um, and people I think, I think have misinterpreted this, um, refers, I think the um, food sovereignty movement, La Via Campesina in particular, made this point in the 90s that um, states were losing their food sovereignty precisely because of the liberalization of the global economy <clears throat> by the WTO. Um, so that's the first point. And I always argued that was an essentialism that was attempting to really draw attention to the politics of the WTO. But more importantly, food sovereignty, of course, refers to um, farming cultures, democratic farming cultures within states. And that's the kind of thing Paul has been emphasizing. And the final point I'd make there is food sovereignty is very important um, in both of those senses with respect to the um, um, <clears throat> rehabilitation of multilateralism, which right now is under attack very directly by the World Economic Forum's unholy alliance with the United Nations. So we need to keep those relationships in mind um, for the future. Okay, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, thank you, and on to Yan Harong. Right, I really appreciate those points, um, especially about the food sovereignty. Uh, about the, uh, the view of China, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the view from China, uh, of course, there are a lot of debates within China, and what's also emerging as hegemonic view in China itself, it, 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 it sort of changes from time to time. So the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, pushed China into very much liberalization. But now the, after 2008 financial crisis and the current Corona crisis, uh, it's pushing China in another way. Uh, so you see more of the state, uh, more of the state confidence in itself in, in terms of hurting capital. <laughs> so you, you have, you see the view, view of the state uh, the, coming from China is also different from time to time. And then there is a need to unpack China as well. And to see uh, how these debates and dynamics within China contradiction, both within and with, uh, from outside is pushing China, pushing uh, sort of the changes. Uh, within uh, within itself. So I have an article uh, published a few years ago about the debate within China about the soybean crisis. So while China is importing a lot of soybean, China, a lot of Chinese in China are crying out about soybean crisis in China. So I think, so these things need to be known. Otherwise we tend to see China as being the big monolith and mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't help with 
uh, for for in, actually engaging Chinese practices and the um, the modernization of diet uh, in China and also in many developing countries is about in upgrading <laughs> the enhancing protein intake and but uh, and for that it's not just the government we talk about the government the academia and also the um, the capital so these are uh, iron triangle which is actually pushing for all of these uh, modernization of diet. Uh, so that needs to be reflected on as well, uh, not just um, one single actor. Um, there's more, many more points which I'd like to engage, but uh, we'll do it another time maybe. Thank you very much for that, uh, that added nuance though uh, and complexity. Uh, now to Rafilwe. Rafilwe, I think you may be muted. I just unmuted. Um, for me, my, my big sort of um, my last point, and in some ways, my big takeaway from today's discussion is that um, the role of agribusiness in governing um, commodity markets and our agro food systems is obviously problematic. And regardless of where the center of power lies, and it's something that um, I believe we've began to interrogate today, but needs to be further interrogated within the context of a new new commodity booms in um, in, in sub-Saharan specifically. And also, I think um, the idea of integrating smallholder farmers into global value chains has been written about extensively and criti and criti and criticized um, and rightly so. However, um, I think COVID has also highlighted opportunities um, in our food systems and opportunities for localizing our food systems. And perhaps um, this moment um, sort of creates a moment for us to um, look in I would say um, uh, within the, 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 the transitions that are taking place locally and um, see what points of leverage um, there may be there um, within um, localized food systems. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ruvile. Um My dear audience, you have probably realized that we are running a few minutes over time. Uh, we made the call, there's just so many fantastic ideas coming out. We do not want to cut people off, but we will be finishing very shortly. So we're just going to give the concluding statements uh, to Andrea and to Paul, and then go to Carol for a final wrap up. So we should be finished uh, within about 10 minutes of when we aimed to finish. And just to let you know, there will also be a poll at the end, so you can give your views on what future topics you would like to see in upcoming webinars. So I'll pass now to Andrea. Okay, I will just going to talk about um, the place of finance capital that sometimes when we speak about countries, we cannot picture how finance capital can be related and not related to, to these countries. And they have their own logics, of course, in relation to countries and to companies. But I think that is a, one main thing that maybe was uh, around our conversation. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, translating companies in, in Latin America, uh, they actually got um, a big part in this ex agribusiness expansion, but also they are uh, founded, uh, financed by this uh, international uh, finance capital. So that is one, one only last um, point. And I will leave Paul to talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, uh, Katie. Uh, just two very short points. I think we cannot confuse food sovereignty, people's food sovereignty, the concept of a democratic uh, food decision-making process. And that is built up locally and nationally and internationally. It's different to self-sufficiency and uh, to food security and to an autarkic economic sense. They're completely different. I think the novelty of food sovereignty is that it's a people's food sovereignty. It's a democratic process. And the last thing, um, very important to start unpacking China. China is a huge country. I, it must have multiple expressions and contradictions and realities. 
and we've got to learn about those contradictions. And from a peasant perspective, we want to interchange and to share experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, and so I will now go over to Carol. Carol, thank you so much for your patience. And thank you also, especially to our interpreters for their great patience with us as we run just a few minutes over. Um, so we'd like thank to ask you. Carol to wrap up with a few yeah. final reflections for the conversation. Carol Hernandez is an associate researcher at the University Program of Bioethics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in agriculture and bioethics. Um, over to you, Carol, thank you. Thank you, good morning from Mexico City. I will try to summarize very quickly. Uh, we he had this question, a new food regime, and that was a central question in, in our conversation today. So we have two more questions. The first one is, are we witnessing the formation of a food, food regime, a fourth food regime? And if so, we have a second question. Will China be the new hegemon? And the answer seems to be, we don't know yet, but we are trying to know what is happening in this moment of transition. So uh, in any case, we have two imminent challenges to the current or future food regime and hegemonic power. On the one hand, we obviously have climate change. And on the other hand, we have this disjunctive between uh, biodigital agriculture without farmers or a peasant food sovereignty and peasant agriculture as a leading movement. And we have to recognize that the food sovereignty, the peasant food sovereignty movement is one of the most important or the most important, or is, it is the most important transnational social movement right now. So how current or future food regime and hegemonic powers deal with these issues will determine the composition of our global food system. Uh, so about the, the role of China in the global food system, we can uh, establish this question. Is China going out the strategy, a way of taking advantage of and thus reinforcing the corporate food regime with its rules, institutions and neoliberal organizing principle? Or this strategy is a way to build its own path toward global hegemony. And we have divergent opinions here in the panel. So indeed, China has some particular features that is important to notice. For instance, China is the most important food importer in the world. Uh, there is a huge expansion of China center agro-import complex with this idea of international self Reliance. And also there is no other country in the world with so much state-owned state or dragon head as they are called companies worldwide. Uh, and other issues are um, this, uh, these companies and investment has been able to circumvent, extend markets and intermediaries. They have built infrastructure around the world and they have this policy of reducing internal rural poverty. And obviously all these processes together are creating new territorialities and circuits of resources and values. So some views from China. Uh, on the first hand, we have uh, this contradictory internal agrarian dynamics. On the one hand, we have depersonalization, and the other hand, we have rural revitalization. Uh, another issue is China's growing global engagement from both from ABOP by corporations and from below by Chinese small and medium farmers, which is very interesting. And we have here these questions. Are Chinese investments mostly driven by profits? Or are they based on coherent national projects of self-reliance? Or are they agro-mercantilist? And we have discussed this throughout our conversation today. Uh, and also we have this question, is really a Beijing consensus against or counteracting the Washington consensus? And Jan states that there, this is not a term Beijing consensus coined or used by Chinese government. And we have another issue that is global Chinese practices do not represent an alternative to current globalization, but they do have a reformist tendency. For instance, they don't require privatization or austerity, and occasionally they break existing monopolies and create new dynamics. And we have some views from Zambia and Argentina. Um, a, the main issue is that financialization of agriculture and land technical capital concentration are not only and not mainly in the hands of Chinese capital. And, but of course, we can see this process of financialization and capital concentration, not only in Chinese hands, but in several hands around the world. 
And also we have the issues of environmental degradation and land grabbing together. And also unsolved problems uh, regarding poverty and hunger. Uh, we can see also marginalization of small farmers and also an important contradiction. We have this strong support to agribusiness in these countries, but at the same time in some countries, just like Argentina and Brazil, we have this new support to a small farmer agriculture and also in some cases to agroecology. So we have all this complexity and all these contradictions going at the same time. And we have this question, Africa is really a, sleep, a sleeping giant. And we, are, we have to talk about this in the context of the new Green Revolution, which specifically target, targets uh, Africa. And some views from La Via Campesina, and the most important is that we have opportunities, but also challenges for peasant agriculture in the present shifting food regime. That is the importance of understanding this process of change. Uh, there is a huge opportunity for food sovereignty, agroecology and indigenous autonomy. But we have to understand what kind of resistance we need to organize right now. And that is all for me. Thank you very much, Carol, for that remarkable act of summing up the, the many rich themes and insights that were shared here today. Um, so with that, I would like to say thank you so much to, to all of our guests, our speakers. Thank you to all of you in the audience uh, for participating and for sharing your questions. Thank you to the whole TNI team for their organizational support. And thank you very much to our interpreters for making it possible for people to listen uh, in their own languages. If you have questions or comments about this webinar series, you can contact Jennifer Franco at jennycfranco at tni.org. In a moment, as I said, you'll also see a poll appearing where you can quickly let us know what topics you would like to see in future sessions. These webinars take place several times a year, but not on a fixed schedule. So you can subscribe to our newsletters or keep an eye on social media and other channels to hear about the next sessions. I'd also like to warmly invite all of you to join TNI's next scheduled webinar, Rhythms of Resistance, uh, sorry, <laughs> Revolutionary Rehearsals, Rhythms of Resistance in North Africa. This will take place on the 24th of June, and you can find the link in the chat uh, as well as finding it on the TNI website. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. We'll leave the chat open for a few moments so you can fill in the poll and wrap up any final conversations. And you'll receive an email in the coming days with a link to the videos for this webinar so that you can share them or rewatch. <laughs> thank you so much to everyone and thank you very much to all of the panelists. Thank you. Wonderful, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And the thank interpreters, you. thank you. Yeah.